So what are these cellular and periodontal reactions to orthodontic tooth movement? I must say this is one of the most critical things for you to learn as a diploma graduate or any orthodontic course. This is the basis of tooth movement. So orthodontic tooth movement is basically derived from prolonged pressure applied to the tooth. The tooth movement occurs and bone remodels around it. Now this is characterized by remodeling changes in dental, um, paradental tissues including pulp, PDL. It's, it, it's just actually a mild inflammatory reaction, including into the gingiva. Many types of forces exist like continuous forces, intermittent and interrupted. Okay, so these forces are how we apply delivery. So removable appliance often has interrupted forces because they're removed and put on. Um, intermittent forces are like things like elastics. Um, but what is an optimal orthodontic force? Well, we know that force should not exceed capillary blood pressure, which is about 20 to 25 grams per centimeter square um, of root surface. If force exceeds that, compression could occur and tissue necrosis in the PDL develops, which is a periodontium. Now, this causes strangulation of the periodontium. It's assumed that optimal orthodontic forces produces tooth movement into the desired position without causing much discomfort or damage to teeth. But at the moment, here is the problem. We have no evidence basis, evidence-based decision-making tools to say for a certain amount of movement this should be the force because it changes from person to person. There's huge biologic variation. A child could take more forces than an adult depending on bone density, cellular reactions, their metabolism. So this is very varied so it's hard to simplify this and it's highly variable. But what we want is not to put a heavy force. What a heavy force does is causes this necrotic periodontium which now needs to have inflammatory cells recruited to come and remove it before tooth movement can proceed. So if anything it slows down tooth movement but it can also cause one more thing is damage to the root surface like root resorption. So we have two types of um, forces uh, that can actually cause, um, it's, it's inter, sorry, the heavy force can cause hyalinization, which is avascular sterile necrosis of PDL. But undermining resorption is when osteoclasts from bone marrow are recruited to come and remove that PDL. So what we're wanting is hyalinization zones to be very minimal, okay, and very minimal undermining resorption. At the end of the day, periodontal tissue is a connective tissue attachment. It's 0.25 to 0.5 millimeter in width, depending on the tooth, and it's a viscoelastic gel. So it's got cellular elements, tissue fluids, it's got neurovascular elements and collagen network. And its normal fa function is to protect um, the tooth from discomfort. So if there's a pressure less than one second, alveolar bone will bend so bone adaptation to functional demands is what PDL does best. So there's many theories of tooth movement, bone bending theory, pressure tension theory, biologic electricity theory, and integrated model. At this stage, we don't believe any one theory is right, that the integrated model probably offers the best way of understanding. So what that integrated model looks like is all the three theories above combined. We believe some bone, bond, uh, bone bending occurs to orthodontic forces that creates actually a biologic electric potential that then recruits more cells. And we also believe pressure and tension from orthodontic forces recruits these chemical messengers as well. So what's really happening, if you see a tooth root in the middle of that donut, as we're putting pressure, and this is pressure coming from the top to the lower left quadrant as we're putting pressure, Osteoclasts are starting to resorb the bone. Now modeling is happening on the outside surface of the bone, but remodeling is happening on the inner area of the bone that surrounds the tooth. So there's a combination of modeling and remodeling that goes on that recruits osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Okay, this is how bone bending occurs, bone adapts, 
and teeth move. Mostly histologic studies have shown us all of this. Um, hyalinization zones are when there is no cellular elements in there because too much force has been applied. Obviously to keep the zone as minimal as possible. Uh, we want teeth to move within bone or with bone rather than outside of bone. So heavy forces can damage that. Um, be very careful. Inflammation is partly responsible for this cellular recruitment. So it is a mild inflammatory process and tissue remodeling occurs because of the force application. But you know, when we relate, a lot of this understanding comes from animal studies. So we have to always take it with caution um, because animal speed of tooth movement of animals and the way their cellular responses doesn't always equate to human biology. So is actually orthodontic tooth movement, are we creating inflammation? It is a mild form of inflammation, we call it, but it doesn't actually have all the classical signs of an inflammatory response. So although cytokines and neuropeptides are recruited, um, the redness, swelling, heat is not there, but pain is there. So we call it, it's an exaggerated form of a normal physiologic turnover combined with a foci of tissue repair. Okay, so that's probably the best definition. So what happens with bone bending? Well, when force is applied, the outer surface of the bone also bends in response. And as this bone bends, the concave surface leads to osteogenesis and the convex surface leads to resorption. So this does explain um, what happens, uh, why teeth move rapidly in extraction side, why orthodontic tooth movement is more rapid in less calcified bones, especially in children. Um, so it explains a lot of the things that we now know to be true. What's bioelectric theory? Well, it talks about whenever forces are applied and bone bends, electric potentials are created within the PDL tissue. And these electric currents generates again a cellular response where bone is either taken away, resorbed or deposited. We understand this uh, that electronegative forces favor osteoblastic activity, so bone forming, whereas positive um, electric signals are more into bone resorption. So this is a, a graph of orthodontic tooth movement as you see a force is applied to this lower central incisor. It's a lingual force and what it's doing is there's a bit of bone bending. There's also within the bone a, a pressures of tensile and compressive areas are formed. So when the bone bends you can see plus and minuses created that actually will now lead to the appropriate activity or the cells recruited. Um, the osteoblasts are now going inside the bone as well. So you're seeing modeling and remodeling. Outside is modeling, inside the bone is remodeling, inside the PDL is remodeling. Orthodontic tooth movement doesn't just progress continuously. We know that there is an initial phase of tooth movement, then a lag phase, and then post lag. What we really want to do is reduce this lag phase because that comes if you've applied very heavy forces. So ideally we want to reduce it and just go from initial to post lag. Because what happens is when you apply a heavy force, you've caused this avascular necrosis and um, you have high zones of hyalinization in the PDL that now need to be repaired and cleared away before tooth movement can progress. So really initial tooth movement, how does the initial phase happen? Well, you, you put pressure on the bone, there's vascular supplies impeded, osteoclasts and fibroblasts are recruited, um, and then within the PDL there's increased activity of osteoclasts. So that's how initial tooth movements start. It also releases cyclic AMP that creates pain. What happens in the lag phase? Well, hyalinization zones occur, especially if forces are heavy. So degeneration starts to happen within the PDL of uh, blood vessels um, uh, and then this tissue now needs to be repaired and removed before bone can continue its um, resorption and, and, and uh, continue tooth movement. One of the problems with this phase is the longer it is, the heavier the force, you're going to get root resorption. So it has to be kept to a minimal. 
And the last phase is the post lag. So after initial, you have a lag phase, then you have a post lag, which is a lot more continuous tooth movement. Why? Because forces are now kept gentle, you're directing teeth, um, there's, there's been some good reorganization of the PDL already. Um, so it's, it's proceeding more frontally. Um, and it's a small inflammatory reaction. I must recommend Profit textbook, Contemporary Orthodontics. This is a table from his textbook that talks about when a pressure is light and heavy, what happens. So what you're seeing here, within a second, if it's light pressure, it's just a little compression of the PDL fluid. But if it's heavy, it can actually cause a bit of bone bending here. Okay, what happens one to two seconds? Well, once the force is applied, PDL fluid is expressed into the space and the tooth moves in. To that space. After three to five seconds is where things start changing. Sustained heavy force will start to now occlude blood vessels in the periodontium. But with light forces that doesn't happen. After minutes of heavy pressure you're going to get blood flow cut off to the pedial area within minutes. Okay, that does not really happen with light forces. In fact, what it does is it just creates some tension and, and cytokines and the right type of prostaglandins and cytokines are released. Hours after heavy pressure, cell death is now starting to occur in that compressed PDL space. Whereas with light forces, again, you actually have more enzyme level change and activity that is more conducive to tooth movement. Four hours later, light forces has increased cyclic AMP. So people often start to say, even with light forces, I've got a bit of pain as orthodontic tooth movement starts. Um, when it comes to heavy forces, that happens again, but also now there's undermining root resorption, more cytokines involved. So there could actually be a higher pain level. Two days after heavy forces, well, the undermining resorption has now come and cleared the area, the compressed avascular sterile area and the zone of hyalinization and our tooth movement starts again. Okay. However, if you continue this for 7 to 14 days of heavy forces, root resorption can occur as quick as that. So it's very important to keep forces low. Uh, it's about 10 to 15 grams, especially to lower incisors periodontally compromised teeth have to even have lower forces. Um, you need to have controlled disease with plaque, contro uh, um, with, with plaque control, no gingival disease. Sometimes doing a pre-orthodontic periodontal therapy to make sure everything is healthy, low inflammation is very important. If there's um, infrabony pockets, make sure that you know, you're not tipping or intruding teeth too much because you, you can exacerbate them. Uh, from a functional aesthetic point of view, if periodontal teeth are flared and procline, you should really intrude them and that can risk the aggravation of orthodontic um, movement. So this is what a center of resistance of a tooth looks like. Because it's a contained body, it is not free in space, it has a center of mass, center of resistance. Usually for a canine, we think it's around um, the, just around the uh, occlusal third of the root, sometimes mid root even, depends on the tooth. Now as bony levels, the trabecular bony levels around it changes, the center of resistance lowers and lowers, getting closer and closer to the apex. So it really depends on the bone levels, okay? What we don't want is applying heavy forces to periodontal teeth. What you also need to understand is the interaction of OPG rank and rank ligand rank L. What you're seeing here is a diagram. Osteoblasts actually have rank L on their cells. Okay, this rank L now connects with rank L receptor on osteoclasts to activate them to go resorb bone. So actually it's the osteoblast that actually dictates the osteoclast now to go resorb bone. So if osteoblastic activity was affected in any way, it would affect osteoclastic activity as well. Now we know OPG can go block. So any mediator of OPG can go block the osteoblast and it can actually stop tooth movement. So this is how we can speed tooth movement by biomodulating these cellular responses. So drugs like vitamin D injections into the PDL or prostaglandin E2 
stimulate the rank L. So rank L ligand, as we know, increases tooth movement. Local injury, corticotomy, just injuring the bone, is, it makes the bone a bit thinner. Um, and these are things we'll discuss more later on, but they are a way to fasten tooth movement. Vibration has known to speed tooth movement. Not highly evidence-based, it's controversial. However, vibration tends to actually upregulate rank L in art. So anything that upregulates rank L will speed tooth movement. Light, low